Good morning. Aloha and ta'alofa to you all. Always encouraged by your presence this morning. Those of you also who are Zooming in, thank you for joining us through Zoom. I want to welcome all of our visitors. We have plenty of visitors this morning. I hope you plan to stay for our, our fellowship meal, our potluck, right after our morning service today. I want to welcome you. Thank you for encouraging us with your presence, choosing to be with us here instead of somewhere on the beach on the island, but choosing to be with us here to worship our Father in spirit and in truth. We continue today with our training in evangelism on how to use back to the Bible. Christianity is a taught religion. If we pay attention in the New Testament, we see Jesus teaching his disciples, commanding his disciples, and it, of course, extends to us that we are to teach others. We just sang the song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. That's something we should be doing in our lives as followers of Christ. We are telling his story to others so that they too can be saved. And so Christianity is taught, right? Notice this passage, Matthew chapter uh, 20, uh, 28, verse 18 through 20. The Bible uh, says that Jesus came and he spoke to his disciples saying, all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Notice Jesus calls us to go, to go and teach. Here's another passage. Christianity is a taught religion. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, this is what Paul said to Timothy, but this applies to all of us, members of the church. Paul says to Timothy, the things that you have heard of me or from me among many witnesses, commit these things, the same commit to faithful men who will be able, notice, to teach others also. How do you ensure the spiritual growth of the church? How do you ensure that there will be future Christians to continue the work in Honolulu area? It's through teaching, right? And so we have this biblical authority to go through training. And right now, we are learning this method of studying with people. The method is known as back to the Bible. Back to the Bible is simple. It's three simple books. You have scriptures that the people would read, that you would read with the person you're studying with. And then right after you read the scripture, there's a fill in the blank or an, a question about the scripture that, that you just read. All right, and so it's simple. New converts, right, babes in Christ have turned around and used this method to teach their family members, to teach their friends. And that says a lot. New converts can do that. Right? If new converts can do that, then the whole church can do that too. Right? Back to the Bible emphasizes the Bible, and that should always be our focus in Bible study. In book one, the lesson is on authority. We start off with the authority of the truth. John 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We talk about what is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus, as he was praying to his father, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if I would know the word of God, if I would live my life according to the word of God, it will set me free, free from the anxiety that life brings, free from the cares of this world. Most important of all, free from the bondage of sin. And so book one is about the truth. 
how the truth originated with the father, passed on to his son, his son passed it on to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit passed it on to the apostles and the inspired writers, and they wrote it down in scriptures. And we have today, after years of God, of God preserving his word, we have today the truth available in writing, 66 books. So if I want to know the truth, right here, right? And so lesson one is so important because you want the person you're studying with to listen to the truth and not listen to man's word. I always encourage when I'm in a Bible study with someone, I always tell them, don't listen to me, right? Don't follow me. I want you to read it for yourself in the New Testament. I want you to follow the word of God because I can be wrong. Man can be wrong. That should always be the approach in Bible study. Let the word of God work on the hearts of men. The psalmist said that the word of God has the power to convert the soul. Not my words, not your words, God's word. And so at the end of lesson one, the person you're studying with, if you use this method, the person you're studying with will come away with this conclusion. I need to listen to the Bible. All right. I, I think the they will come away with the conclusion. I believe the Bible is sufficient to teach me about God, to teach me about what I need to do in order for me to be saved. I don't need no Greek books. I don't need no catechisms. I don't need some additional revelation that came way later to tell me about God. I have the truth once for all delivered to the saints. Jude and verse three, right? That's why it's important to start the study with lesson one, because then everything that follows is all the word of God, not the word of man. And if they don't agree with scriptures, you can't do anything, right? You're not going to force someone to become a Christian who doesn't agree with the scriptures. And so there have been Bible studies that I stopped because we got to the point where, well, you just read it from the scripture and the person said, and the person still said, well, I don't really agree with the scripture. And then I would say, well, there's no point of us studying because I can't force you. If you will not believe the word of God, what's the point of study? All right. So lesson one on authority is important. Book two is about the church, all right? Not Lima's church, not your church, not someone else's church that they founded in recent years. Book two is about the church that we read about in the New Testament. And we've covered two sections about the church already in our study. We're still in this book, lesson two, all right? In the first lesson, we emphasize that Jesus said that he will build his church, Matthew 16 and verse 18. After the great confession by Peter, Jesus said, based on Peter's confession, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Based on that confession, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The Bible tells us in those scriptures that we looked at, there's only one church, right? Take the Bible out of the picture and look at Christianity today, quote unquote, Christianity today. What do we see? We see what men created. Men have created many different churches or summarized denominationalism. Right? You stay with the Bible. The scriptures teach one church. Ephesians 1 verse 20 through 23, right? That God has given Jesus the authority to be head over all things to the church which is his body. He, the, he is the head of the church. The church is his body. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 4, the Bible says there is one body. The logic of the scriptures teaches one head, one body means G there is Jesus and there is his church. And I told you last lessons, uh, the last couple of lessons, I love to draw stick figures. How about my drawing right here? Right? I love that. It's simple. It's a simple drawing. I've drawn this picture many times in study with people. I'm currently studying with someone. I, recently, I just drew this picture. Uh, and so 
This picture communicates what the scriptures teach, right? If you read those passages, it teaches there's one head. Jesus is the head of the church. There's one body. The body is the church. And that's logical. That's the picture Paul used by inspiration. You know the picture man used? One head and multiple bodies. I didn't draw that one. But you can picture it in your mind if I drew it. It'll be one head and multiple bodies connected to one head. That's not even logical. That's not even the logic that Paul used, right? And so we continue our study in book two of the church. Uh, the second subject that we covered in, in this book is the organization of the church. That was the last lesson. We talked about how the scriptures give an organization of the church, that the organization of the church is Jesus as the head. And for churches today, you would have elders, not elder, elders, men who are qualified according to the scriptures. First Timothy 3, verse 1 through 6, if you want to read the qualifications. Then under the eldership, you have men who are deacons. Yes, by the way, elders are not women. The scriptures make the distinction. They said the husband of one wife. A woman cannot be that unless you don't know what a woman is. The deacons must also be male, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 to, uh, to 12, right? We have the leadership of the church. So you have Jesus as the head, the elders or shepherds of the flock. Then you have the deacons who serve under the eldership. And then us, right? The members. Yes, me too. The preacher is a member of the church. He just happens to be the one preaching, all right? But the leadership of the church is shown in the scripture. There are no presidents. There are no vice presidents. There are no board of directories. There is no one man sitting on an quote-unquote infallible seat ruling over the church. There's no such thing. Again, if we stay with the Bible, we would learn the organization of the church as according to God. Today's subject is extremely important. I want to talk about the worship of the church. That's what we're doing this morning. Right? We came here, joined together in hearts, joined together in the right spirit. That is, we have the right attitude, humble, an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of adoration, of appreciation for our God. And then also we are joined together in doing the things that the early Christians did in worship to God. We join together in doing the truth, for following the truth. And that's why we read that scripture this morning. Because God desires true worshipers. And I know you want to be one of them. I want to be one. And I know you are true worshipers of God. God desires that. And the scripture says in John 4 and verse 24, that true worshipers worship God. I mean, back up, must worship God in spirit and in truth. And so this morning, the same format, I'm going to read the scriptures, and then you fill in the blank with me. All right, I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. So I need your participation. Here's the first scripture. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Question or fill in the blank. Must we worship God in spirit and in truth? Yes. yes amen. That's literally what we just read. All right, that, this is simple Bible stuff. All right. Here's the second scripture. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Church, what is truth? Right? The word of God. I, I love that. Zach, he said, thy word, right? There were times in Bible studies where a person would ask, who is talking? That's it. Context is important. So there, you might be studying with someone and they're reading, who's talking and who is he talking to? Whose word is he talking about? All right? 
And so you might take the time to explain the context. Have them read from verse 1. They will know, oh, it's Jesus. He is praying. He is talking to the Father. And he's saying the words of the Father, the word of God is truth. All right. Here's a follow-up question. Since we must worship God in truth, must we worship God as directed in the Bible? I want you to put some emphasis on that. Yes. Must we worship God uh, uh, as he directed in the Bible? Absolutely. Right? We're not here to do our will. We are here to do his will. I cannot just worship God however I want to worship God. That's not how it works, right? If we pay attention to the totality of Scripture, when it comes to the object of worship or the subject of worship, God gives instructions. I'm glad we don't have to worship the Old Testament ways, amen? That's a lot of instructions, right? You got to have your, you got to have the perfect animal. You got to bring it. The priest will offer that offering on your behalf. Among many other offerings under the Old Testament. God, the point I'm emphasizing is God gives instruction, teaching. When it comes to worship, I cannot just worship however I want. He is God. He gets to define how I approach his holy throne. How I offer to him the worship that glorifies him. Here's the next scripture, church. Matthew 15 and verse 9. Jesus quoted this Old Testament passage and he applied it to the current worship of the Pharisees and the scribes. Sometimes I like to read verse 8 along with verse 9 of Matthew 15. Right? This is in the context of the dis discussion that started with the washing of hands. Uh, the Pharisees and scribes said to Jesus, why don't your disciples wash your hands according to the traditions of the elders, of the fathers? Traditions of the elders. You know what Jesus' comeback was? It's a mic drop moment. Jesus said to them, why do you transgress God's law by your traditions? Mic drop. All right. But verse 8 and verse 9, Jesus quoted this. And he said this about their worship, the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, these people draw near to me with their lips, and, or, or they, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then verse 9, he says, and in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Huh. Here's the question, church. Is it possible to worship God in vain. That's what Jesus said about these Pharisees and the scribes. Let me tell you something. The Pharisees and the scribes, we should respect their knowledge of scriptures. I wouldn't dare stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees and say, let me tell you about the law of Moses. They know more than I do. But the problem was they didn't follow the law. They followed the traditions. They came up with traditions and made them laws. Right? Read Matthew 23. Right? So it's possible to worship God in vain. And their worship was in vain because the commandments they were following were not God's, but man's. Here's the next question. If we worship God according to the commandments of uninspired men, will God accept it? No. All right. I'm glad you guys understood what that meant. Uninspired men. I'll tell you, sometimes in a Bible study, you would have to explain that. Because people will ask you, what does that mean? Uninspired men. All right. Men who were not led by the Holy Spirit to write down the will of God. Those are uninspired men. All right. Going to the next question. Luke chapter 22. Now, after we highlight we must worship God in spirit and truth, after we highlight that you can worship God in vain if you follow man's commands, now we're transitioning into 
the things we do in worship. This is the first one, the Lord's Supper, right? Not in any particular order, but these are things that we are doing in worship. When we do worship, we observe the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, verse 19, 19 through 20 says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also, or likewise, he also took the cup after saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is, said, which is shed for you. Here's the question. Did Jesus command his disciples to partake of the Lord's Supper? What we're reading here is when he instituted it, right? It was a Passover meal. Right? That was the occasion. And Jesus used that occasion to give the Christians Passover meal, to establish our Passover meal. The Lord's Supper, unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. Right? And he commands them to eat it and drink of it in remembrance of him. We just read this morning from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and onward. We are commanded to do that. Because whenever we do that, the Bible says, whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're making a proclamation. We're telling the world, Jesus is coming back. We're telling the world, we believe Jesus died and was buried and was resurrected. And he is coming back. That's, it. That's what we're proclaiming when we eat the Lord's Supper. The next scripture here, go with me, 1 Corinthians 10. Or follow on the screen. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 16, by the way, in the Bible study, share the reading load, right? Don't let the person you're studying with do all the reading. <laughs> you help them with the reading. You share the reading load. And I mentioned before, there are times where there are certain passages you want them to read because they are powerful passages. There are passages that would just, you know, they just, they, it pricks the heart, right? You let them read those passages. But share the reading when you're studying with someone. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Rhetorical questions from the Apostle Paul to cause the Corinthians to think about how they were observing the Lord's Supper. That's the context, right? They were not observing the Lord's Supper in a glorious manner. All right. They were they were doing it, they were going through the motions. They were, they they had no respect for the Lord's body, not deserve, not discerning his body. But also there was a problem with idolatry in Corinth. Right? You gotta you gotta look into Corinth and the setting of Corinth. Corinth was a, 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 a key place in history. A, a great place for trading because Corinth was located on an isthmus, a land bridge, where boats from everywhere would come and cross to, to head to Rome and the other parts of the world. Uh, there was this land bridge. It was safer to go there, unload your ship, load to another ship, or if it's smaller, drag your ship across land and cut a, a, a dangerous journey that would travel south of the Aegean area, right? And so Corinth was, was a melting pot, much like Hawaii. Corinth was like Hawaii. Lots of culture, lots of different beliefs. And in Corinth, there were many idols worshipped there. Athena, Apollos, um, who else? There was a god of the sea. And Poseidon, there were, there were a lot of different gods worshipped there. And so a lot of the people that became Christians in Corinth, they came from that background, right? And so some of them were struggling with this idea of idolatry. I'm worshipping God. I want to worship God. But this is how I worship growing up in Corinth. I worship these idols. And Paul says, you can't do both. You can't be joined to idolatry 
and worship at those tables of false gods when we have the true God? He said, you can't do that. And that's the idea here. He's trying to call them, do, do it right. Worship God. Right? Don't worship the false gods of the Greeks and the Romans. And so the fill in the blank here, by the way, I, I do explain that sometimes in the study. I explain Corinth and the history of Corinth. It's necessary, especially when you study with someone who actually cares about the context, who actually wants to know what's the setting behind this, this situation. All right, so you have to explain that. But fill in the blank. The cup is a communion of the blank of Christ. The blood, right? Not the literal cup but the content in the cup, the fruit of the vine, all right? That's a whole nother study. The bread is the communion of the body of Christ, all right? So when we eat the bread like we did this morning, when we drank of that cup, we join in fellowship. The word communion there is the word fellowship. We're in fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20 and verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Here's a follow-up question. When God told the Israelites in Exodus 20 and verse 8, Exodus 20 and verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Right? Exodus 20 and verse 8. When God told the Israelites in Exodus 20 and verse 8, to remember the Sabbath, did he mean for them to keep every Sabbath? If you want to remember Sabbath, the Sabbath comes around every week, right? So they must keep every Sabbath. When those Christians, the ones in Acts 20 and verse 7, when those Christians met on the first day of the week to eat the Lord's Supper, did they do it on the first day of each week? Did they? Yes, that's what the Bible says, right? We're, we're bringing that principle. If they were to keep the entire, keep every Sabbath, then every first day of the week, they met to observe the Lord's Supper. That means every time we meet on the first day of the week, we observe the what? The Lord's Supper. I grew up a Methodist, born and raised a Methodist. Methodist Church only observed the Lord's Supper once a month on the first Sunday of the month. All right. The scripture says on the first day of the week. So that should mean every Sunday of the month we should observe the Lord's Supper. In some places, the Lord's Supper is never observed. Right? You walk into a church and they don't observe the Lord's Supper, run from it. Right? But you know what they will observe? Giving. They'll always collect your money. Forget remembering the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Let's make sure we collect the people's money. It's kind of funny when you think about it, but that's the reality in a lot of churches. Right? When, or um, the last question here, should Christians today eat the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week? Yes. So every time we meet, we eat the Lord's Supper. Acts 2 and verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. This, this is in the setting when the church was established. The church started worshiping. They started doing these things as they glorify God. And so the reading tells us this. Let's fill in the blank. The disciples continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What Paul wrote, we need to pay attention. What Peter wrote, we need to pay attention to. It. The inspired writings of the New Testament. They are commandments for Christians to follow. All right. Again, if you understand lesson one on authority, you understand that what Paul wrote was what God wanted him to write. That what Paul said was the commandments of God. First Corinthians 14 
verse 37, Paul said that if anyone thinks himself a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Right? That's important, church, because there's so many who say they're Christians, but they say things like, that was Paul's opinion. We don't follow Paul. We follow Jesus. Right? They don't realize that what Paul said, Jesus gave Paul the Holy Spirit in order for him to write what he wrote, to say what he said to the churches. So it's God's, it's what God said, all right? We must continue, and we still today continue in the apostles' doctrine. We don't have apostles in the church, right? Like, we don't have living apostles here in the church, we still have apostles in the church. They're right in the scriptures. We learn from them. All right. Fill in the blank. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship. I just, I just fill it in. Sorry. <laughs> in fellowship. What's the next thing? In breaking of bread. Let me back up to fellowship. The idea of togetherness. This morning when we sang songs. Right? We were singing together to God, singing praises to God. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we did that together. That's the idea of fellowship. I love the picture of fellowship in Acts chapter 2. Go read it, the latter part. These Christians were one. They shared their things. They shared the Lord's Supper. They were just together. And it's an example for us. Breaking of bread in the scriptures. This vernacular, the phrase breaking of bread, can refer to two things. The context will determine which thing is referred to. So number one, breaking bread can refer to the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7. Also, breaking bread can refer to their meals, right? When they gather together to have their meals, breaking bread, right? And so we have to see which is being referenced. And in Acts chapter 2, you get to see two of the different references. It does refer here in verse 42 to uh, the Lord's Supper. But elsewhere, I believe it's verse 44 through 47, you see that it refers to their daily meals. They had it every day, right? breaking bread every day. When it refers to the Lord's Supper, we don't eat the Lord's Supper every day, do we? No, on the first day of the week. The last part, and in prayers. All of our acts of worship found in one verse here. Prayer, teaching, the communion, fellowship, giving, singing. All here in Acts chapter 2. Question, will we, please, will we be pleasing to God if we continue steadfastly in these things? If we do, if we do what they did, we become what they were. All right? If we follow what they did in the first century, today in the 21st century, we become first century or New Testament Christians, I should say. And that's what we are. Continuing on, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, we're talking about giving now. Right? And this is not the church taking your money. This is out of your heart. This is not tithing. This is out of your heart. As God has prospered you according to what you have purposed cheerfully for the Lord, right? We're not telling you to give us a set amount. You decide what you want to give to God with a cheerful heart, right? Notice this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, Paul's orders were God's orders. So you must also do, or you must do also, on the first day of the week, the same day you eat the Lord's Supper, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Question, is it God's will that we give as we have been prospered? Yes. All right. You want to add Malachi 3 to that on your notes? I always do this in the study. I sometimes take the person to Malachi 3, because in Malachi 3, God indicts Israel. God knows he blesses Israel, but Israel gave leftovers to God. Israel gave the sick animals to offer sacrifice 
to God in the book of Malachi. And Malachi says, will a man rob God? So I always emphasize that. God knows what he has blessed us with. All right? And so we must give as God has blessed us. He knows what he has blessed us with. And do it cheerfully. Is it God's will that we give as we had? I read that already. Are we to make contribution on the same day we are partaking of the Lord's Supper? Yes. That's what they did. All right? Notice this. I alluded to this before, but this always helps, makes the person think about the importance of the Lord's Supper. All right? How often do churches you attend partake of the Lord's Supper? Trust me, church, I have been to many churches, Pentecostal, Mormon, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, Methodist. I've actually sat through several worships and been there. I already mentioned the Methodist church once a month, first, first, day, first Sunday of the month. Some Seventh-day Adventists, not at all. You know, we're, they don't observe the Lord's Supper, but they'll take up a collection. All right. Jehovah's Witness, you get to see the emblems once a year in their tower meetings. You don't get to partake of it. I can go on today, but the point is, is made, right? How often do churches you attend take up a collection? Almost every single church this morning very likely took up a collection. But not all of them observed the Lord's Supper this morning. All right. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Now we're talking about the music of the church. I love the music of the church. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. The Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Here's the question. Are we to sing and worship to God? Yes. Yes. I always take time to break down this passage. Because the person I'm studying with very likely came from a place where there are instruments played, where there's a stage, there's a band, and so on and so forth. And so this is going to be shocking to them. If you're studying with people and you share this with them, it's going to shock them. All right. And so I take time to break down this verse. All right. The Bible says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There is an instrument that Christians use to worship God. And it is not one we play by blowing into it. It is not one we play by striking it with our hands or beating on it. And it's not one that is made by man's hand. It's the instrument that God made. The heart. And notice in every act of worship, our heart is engaged. When we pray, we pray with understanding with our heart. When we sing, we sing with a melody in our heart, not with our hands, not with anything outward. The instrument is the heart. When we observe the Lord's Supper, Paul says, let one examine himself. Look within your heart. Let one discern the Lord's body. Think about the body of Jesus in your heart. When you give, the Bible says, give with a cheerful heart. Every act of worship, there's an instrument that is used as we approach God. That instrument is the heart. Nowhere is mentioned mechanical instruments. Sometimes in the study, the person will say, what about the Old Testament? I love that you mentioned the Old Testament. I was, I'll tell them, remember our study in book one? What testament are we under? Are we under the Old Testament or the New Testament? We are under the New Testament. But they say, well, you know, my Bible has the New Testament and then the book of Psalms in the end. So it must be part of the New Testament, right? Many people believe that. You, you have to help them. They believe just because you buy a Bible with the New Testament and the book of Psalms at the end of it, doesn't mean the book of Psalms is part of the New Testament. That's why you want the whole Bible, all right? Jesus said the Psalms were part of the Old Testament, Luke chapter 24. And so that's why the music of the church is to sing from the heart. I want to say this, church. 
even if you can't sing the melody, you can still sing to God. Even if you sound like, like how I sound like this morning when I led that song for the first time, it didn't sound very good when it was off tune. We were still singing to God because the melody is in our heart. All right. We don't have time to look at history. Or let me look at this first question here. Does this passage mention mechanical instruments of music? It, it doesn't anywhere. And I'll tell you, it doesn't anywhere in the new covenant. Nowhere. All right. The only other place people argue for instruments is because they read about trumpets in Revelation. That's in heaven. We're talking about the worship of the church, not the worship of the saints in heaven forever. We're talking about here in the worship of the church. It's different. All right. We don't know. We don't know everything that's happening in heaven. We get those little insights from what has been revealed. But church historians tell us that the followers of Christ did not use mechanical instruments of music in their worship for hundreds of years. It was not until AD 500. Church was established around AD 33. It was not until about AD 500 that the first instrument was introduced in the worship. 500 years. And then men decide, you know what? Let's do it our way. All right. You have the history of synagogue worship. Synagogue worship, there was no instrument in it. And the Christian worship came out of, of synagogue worship. All right. The people who were Christians first were Jews who worshiped in the synagogue. That's what they were doing, singing. The Greek Orthodox Church, which broke off from, from Rome, from Roman Catholic Church, has never used instrumental music in worship. Last I checked, and I haven't checked recently, it's still true. The Greek Orthodox Church does not do that. They don't have instruments in worship. When you attend the Church of Christ, you will notice we do not have instrumental music in worship. You don't see us playing things up here, but what you will see us plucking the strings of our heart as we sing songs to God. That's our instrument. That's what God wants. Give to God what he wants. He wants our hearts. Give to him. Genesis 6. We're way past time. So, I'm going to finish this lesson next week. If you will come back for it. Because there's still a lot more to cover. All right. We'll finish this lesson next week. I, I want to respect your time. Even though I've gone over, I, I, do, I do not want to go any longer. Because um, I know some of you are clocking out. But next week, we pick up right where we left off in addition to this next section of, of, of uh, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Maybe you're here this morning and you want to obey the gospel. We offer God's invitation. To obey the gospel, you need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to repent of your sins. Or you, Let me back up. You need to believe what you hear. You need to believe Jesus is the Son of God, John 3 and verse 16. You need to repent of all your sins. Give up sin and follow Jesus. You want to confess Jesus before witnesses. If you're ready to be baptized this morning, you will come up here. I'll take your confession, and then we will baptize you. When you make the great confession, we baptize you. The purpose of baptism, according to the word of God, is to wash away your sins do you want your sins washed away this morning? If that's you, this is the invitation for you. If you need prayers and encouragement, this invitation is for you as well. Come make known your requests. Let your family pray with you and for you. Whatever you need, please respond to the invitation as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.